starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. This is Joe Macbeth, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, and I welcome you to this morning's webinar. Um, this is a new webinar in partnership with NADSP, NYSACRA, the, office, the New York State Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, and their Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation. This is the first of a series of seven webinars. They are New York-centered, um, but all are welcome. Um, these webinars will be recorded and archived, and they can be found on uh, www.workforcetransformation.org, and you don't have to write that down because we'll show that to you later on in this, in this webinar. This morning's um, speakers are Kathy Brown, Kathy is the Director of Professional Development and Human Rights at FREE in Long Island, New York, and Kathy is also a faculty member for NADSP. And joining Kathy is the one and only Regis Obajiski, who, among other things, is currently the consultant to the Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation at OPWDD and a mentor to me. Um, before I turn it over to them, I just want to make one announcement. Because these webinars are um, sponsored by the State of New York, we will be sending everybody who is on this call a survey through email. We ask that you, send, you fill out that survey and send it back to us, and we will include those instructions on the email. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, Kathy and Regis. Get it? Kathy and Regis. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you folks now. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Joe. All right. Good morning, everybody. Kathy and Regis here. So um, we're going to talk to you a little bit today about the crosswalk. Okay. The, uh, the reason we did this, when I say we, these are the Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation. And although this has gotten some play at the New York State Office for Persons with Developmental Disabilities, uh, it really is a uh, it is something created by the by the regional centers. We'll talk. Uh, those of you who are, not, are unfamiliar with the regional centers for workforce transformation, we'll we'll speak a little bit about that as uh, as, as time goes on. Um, what we want to do is is not to pull apart all, all the initiatives that OB, OPWDD has has put forward to the field, but rather. What we, what we want to do is, is speak to the commonalities and to kind of demythologize or demystify is a sort of a new word these days. It's like transformation. Everybody talks about transformation. Uh, we're demystifying. Uh, we're trying to make it simple uh, because the initiatives that, uh, that, that have come from the state as well as, as well as from the federal government are many, many a number. And <clears throat> we, uh, we want to put that in the context of the change that we're experiencing as a, as a field, um, that we're being required to uh, transform ourselves. Uh, what we want to do, again, is be as concrete as we possibly can and uh, point out how do we get from uh, a concept to actual uh, service and supports uh, the delivery. And, uh, and then finally, what does it all look like? And how do we know? It's all made a difference, and how do we know that we have succeeded? So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to put it in the context of a crosswalk. What is it? Well, we all know what a crosswalk is. It's a marked part of the road. Pedestrians have the right of way and get to the other side safely. It's also comparing information from two or more sources, so to determine an agreement. What we're going to do today, Regis and I, is give you a way to navigate through all of this information. As we just said, all the different initiatives, whether it's from the state or federal government, we're going to be your guide today. We're going to help guide you, make sense of all of this. When uh, a provider, and all of you on the, on the call, or not, maybe not all, but, but most probably are, are providers, uh, are, are getting an enormous amount of detail uh, from government and a lot of it is uh, essential and, and time sensitive and what we often feel is the, the, the sense of urgency 
that is required. Well, we've got to do this now, and it has to be done by um, by this by by this or that particular time. And we often feel as though these things are somewhat atomistic. You know, you got this, and then then the next thing, and then the next thing, uh, and it all feels a bit disconnected, and we feel a bit uh, a bit overwhelmed. And that's the reason. Uh, we're here to try to make sense of, of, uh, of, of it all. And we want to point out what's, uh, what's important but not urgent. Uh, in, a, in a sense, what's, uh, what's really familiar uh, to us. And uh, things that are connected, yet they're distinct from each other. Uh, so when we're going to be speaking about these five initiatives, and we're going to do it in general terms, um, we're going to show that they, there, there are differences, but the connection really is, is really quite poignant. And uh, that a lot of this, as we may not feel this way, but uh, they are related and, uh, and they really are reasonable. So as Reed just said, we're going to try to help you make sense of it all. And what we're really trying to put together for everybody is a crosswalk to common sense. It was created by the Regional Centers of Workforce Transformation because honestly what we were hearing a lot of is there's a lot going on. There's too much stuff. It's too fast. And it felt like it was very disconnected to people. So the center decided that we were going to help make sense of it because we're going to show how they're really related. I just want to take a minute just to tell you about the Regional Centers of Workforce Transformation. We were um, come together whose mission is to synchronize our efforts to develop ethics and competencies for New York State's over 110,000 DSPs. It's not a regulatory or oversight, but really just put together to be support. We've been together three years now, and we got three more years at least, but we really wanted to help all of the providers. The services are now expected to be more than just um, something that we give, they really have to transform. And the only way service transformation is possible is through workforce transformation. So that was really a little bit on the regional centers for workforce transformation and who we are. And now putting this crosswalk together, as our mission is, is to help support the providers make sense of all of these things. So we're going to help point you in the same direction and help be your guide with it. Okay, so we just wanted to tell you, um, as I said, it's really all the same stuff. Um, we're going to be talking today about CQL and the personal outcome measures. We're not necessarily going to get into detail about each of them. Hopefully you're familiar, but we'll give you just enough. And then another initiative is the DSP core competencies and the NADSP, the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals Code of Ethics as well as the HCBS federal regulations, person-centered planning. These are the five areas that we're really going to be talking about with all of you today. One of the things that we left out in this, uh, in this list uh, was, uh, was PROMOTE, uh, which was an initiative that, uh, was, that started in, in both sectors, both the private sector as well as the public sector. It's continuing uh, in state operations, but for the time being, PROMOTE is on hold uh, in the in, in the private sector, so we just decided that we would we would leave this off. But that's a piece that we have added in another in another document to show that there really are are six things, and and they all do uh, tie together. Um, what they have, what all of these, what each of these uh, five initiatives that we're we're addressing uh, have in common is that they're all very much highly person centered. Um, I, I think that uh, person-centered is uh, sort of an overused uh, uh, term, and it's one that we may feel a little too comfortable with uh, at, at times. Of course, I'm person-centered. What do you mean? Why would, why would I need a, a regulation on, on per person-centeredness? Uh, why would that require any, anything more explicit than, than the term person-centered? So we, we more or less feel as though we're, we're, we're all person-centered, but when you when you when you break it down and 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 someone says, well, what do you mean by that? It uh, it takes on it takes on a, a much wider uh, dimension. Uh, each one values respect and uh, self-determination, and uh, we'll be we'll be addressing self-determination, which is really in a sense the um, the essential principle of service transformation. And, uh, 
and uh, you know the regional centers, and uh, you'll you'll see the address of the uh, website of the regional centers for workforce transformation at the end, and Kathy will point that point that out. That that this is a very a very detailed and uh, and nuanced term, and uh, it really requires um, a a certain technology, and I don't mean computer tech. Technology. It requires a way of doing things that is um, a little bit more uh, sophisticated than I think our, our field uh, has been has been used to. So you know we've we've learned a lot from uh, the field. When I say we, I'm talking about the regional centers, and uh, 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 the uh, the centers again are they're all local efforts. They're all collaborative efforts. It isn't uh, uh, New York State. Office uh, OPWDD um, insisting that things be done this way or that way. It really has to do with how the field is responding to this and um, pointing out excellence. Uh, it shifts the control from the professional to the individual. Uh, it isn't the professional that's saying, "Welcome to our program. We hope you fit in." Uh, it's it's shifting the control of the individual uh, to the point of you know how can we best uh, serve you not necessarily in this per, this day program let's say it demands uh, the enhancement of organizational culture in fact all five initiatives are culture initiatives and uh, uh, culture is a is a is a is a loaded term and basically it means what does it feel like to be here, what does it feel like to live here? What does it feel like to work here? All of these things uh, are all of these all those kinds of questions uh, point to uh, what organizational culture is. So it demands an enhancement of organizational culture in a very deliberate exercise, and that requires a whole other a whole other webinar, folks. <laughs> um, and each of these requires the entire workforce to be knowledgeable, skillful, and and ethical. And that's the entire workforce. It's not only DSPs, direct support professionals. It uh, it is uh, it is it is everybody. All right. So here we are. We've been talking about the crosswalk. So what we've done is, is just showing you a snapshot of it. This is just a piece of the document, which at the end will also show you how to access it on the website. But this is a snapshot of the crosswalk. And as you can see, across the top are the five initiatives. There's CQL, the POMS, the core competencies, the ethics, the HCBS regulations, and person-centered planning. And what we're going to do is we're going to help walk you through it, going from left to right. And we're going to show you how this all makes sense. And again, after the webinar, you can certainly go to the website. You'll be able to get the actual document itself. And then you will be able to utilize this to really help you, again, as we said, make sense of all of this. All right. Again, this is, uh, this is not prescriptive. In other words, you have to memorize everything in these boxes because the, the crosswalk itself, as Kathy pointed out, this is a, a snapshot of one page. There are five pages, and you really start where you are, and we'll, we'll demonstrate that because we're going to be uh, uh, telling a couple of stories and then going from the stories to the crosswalk and show how this, this actually works. And rather than looking at, let's say, the principles or the, the uh, these words within these boxes and, uh, and, then, and then going to people's lives. So we, we're starting from, from left to right and say, well, why are, why are we starting with the POMS, the personal outcome measures? The uh, Council on Quality and Leadership uh, established uh, the POMS more than 20 years ago. So in a sense, it's the oldest of, of these initiatives. And, um, and, uh, and it really it has, in a sense, the widest play. Uh, these are internationally validated measures. Uh, they're the most practice habilitative measures that look very simple and yet they challenge absolutely absolutely everything. And many of many of many of you who are on this uh, this webinar um, may have uh, varying degrees of acquaintance with the Council on Quality and Leadership's personal outcome measures. And <clears throat> practicing them is a whole lot different than uh, than reading them. Uh, when you look at the 2021 20, POMS, they're, uh, they're deceptively 
uh, deceptively simple, uh, but they are, are uh, profound in, in helping people to uh, express and uh, to change their, their lives. All right. Now, if you're moving again as we're going from left to right in the crosswalk, we also have the Code of Ethics and the Core Competencies. The NADSP Code of Ethics, National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals Code of Ethics, is something that uh, New York State has adopted, but they are across the board for everywhere you might be. But it is a code, and it's a professional code to guide and maintain high standards for the life-changing work that the DSPs do every day. It really is helping people um, go beyond their own personal values and helps outline the standards of their conduct and professionalism in nine important areas. Now, along with that, we have the core competencies, which that was created from nationally validated community support skills standards. How are we going to do all of this? How is our workforce going to do all of these initiatives? So this gives a guideline and something to aspire to to help the workforce be competent. What is it that they need? What skill set they require in order to deliver these services? It really is very similar to the POMS in the sense that to, in order to find out that information, the people who are do, delivering the services have this, this code of ethics and they are demonstrating their competencies. It is a constant commitment to the individual and intentionality, that is a word that um, I'm hoping that many people start to be using a lot more. It's not by accident. It's not because, well, that team member, that staff person, that DSP just has it in them. It is done with intention. And this is how the providers can help support the workforce to be able to do this. So we're moving from left to right. And here we are, we come to the federal home and community-based services, the HCBS standards. This is telling us individual self-directed outcomes, what they have to look like by March 2019 in order to qualify for federal funds. This is the federal government telling all of us this. And it's really basically saying that the services are defined by personal autonomy and choice. A person can choose their own schedule. A person can decide what they want to eat, when they want to eat it, who can visit them, where they visit them, what they're going to do every day, where they live, where they work, where they play, and who they interact with. As Regis said earlier, it's no longer acceptable, okay, you can well be welcome into our program, we'll see if we can fit you in. It's really going to be what the person defines and what they want and how they're going to be able to make those choices. And talking about choices, um, that's something that's going to be very difficult for a lot of our workforce because it's new for them to be able to support people to make their own decisions. And they have to be able to make informed decisions. I'm just going to mention here, and I'll probably mention a little bit later, NADSP right now is conducting workshops on informed decision making. And we're really going all over the country because if we're really truly going to abide by the federal regulations, we don't want to just do it with a rubber stamp and we don't want to do it saying it but not meaning it. You really want your workforce to be able to help the people they support make informed decisions. And the federal government is going to make sure we're doing that by March 2019. So we're moving on. Moving on to uh, person center planning, which is the all the way over to the right on the uh, on the crosswalk and their person person centered planning and those of you who are familiar with uh, the person centered planning regulations that have come out of the uh, out of the state of New York you will see a remarkable similarity uh, to the uh, HCBS the home and community based services um, uh, uh, prescriptions uh, Kathy was just talking about visitors and food and and um, what, what one has to do to uh, to get there. But the, the similarity uh, of of the, of the person centered planning process is uh, to reach to the maximum extent possible, uh, directing one's own planning for services, making informed choices, and uh, choices and informed choices are really quite different as uh, as we know it's, uh, choices can be whimsical capricious uh, off the cuff 
Uh, they're not necessarily informed choices. Informed choices are those bigger choices that uh, that people make that have to do with the uh, the direction of their life. That's what we're talking about here in in uh, in person centered planning, as well as uh, as in the in the HCPS. And I think what what's required here in person centered planning is. Uh, uh, person-centered thinking. That's the Michael Small concept, as you, as you know. Uh, and person-centered thinking is, it really means that, that everybody that's uh, providing, providing services really needs to get to a place where they really understand this deep down, that our, their thinking is really adjusted. It isn't so much uh, that you, a, pers a, a, a professional is prescribed to act one way or the other, as much as it is uh, that you you really have the correct idea and the correct principle about putting uh, putting the person first. So it involves uh, it involves informed decisions, uh, informed choices about uh, about services, and not underscoring informed. And uh, it involves uh, parties uh, chosen by the person in the uh, in the entire planning process. A lot of this again is not new. Uh, to us, we, we know this from, um, uh, in, in, at least in New York, uh, Part 633, Part 636, 635, a bunch of others, uh, where all of this was really, really explicated. And, but it really requires a continuous learning process on the part of professionals to ask, to really listen and pay attention, and to discover. Uh, discover new things and honor a person's uniqueness and and uh, self-expression and and, and self-determination. Often, uh, those of us who have been in this field for some time and perhaps providing services to the same person all of those years, perhaps decades, uh, we think we know the person, and uh, it isn't necessarily so. Uh, we don't know the person completely, intimately, and and the process, the, the whole idea of this process, is that the process reveals who the uh, who the person uh, who the person is. We learn things that we we just didn't know before, and and uh, we see this in the in the palms exercise exercises with the uh, the interview interview process. Those of you who are certified uh, interviewers uh, for CQL uh, palms know that it is not a simple process. Uh, um, uh, and uh, it re requires deep listening and, uh, and person-centered thinking. So we've been talking about the five initiatives and we covered a little bit uh, of information about each. And as you hear Regis and I talking about it, you hear us using the same words, the same language for each initiative. And that really shows how all of them are related. Um, what we're hoping again with this um, guide and this crosswalk is it's not viewed as separate. Okay, now we have to do the palms and now we have to do this. It really is how they all make sense working together. Another way that we're going to help make sense in the crosswalk is not just from left to right, but we've also um, divided it up into three sections. And again, if you're familiar with the palms, the first area that we often look at for a person is myself. It's the person that they are right now. Who am I? Am I the result of the impact of family and friends, the people that are in my life? Who am I? Am I my, my, my experiences and the decisions? Are they mine? Are they conditioned by somebody else? The area of myself is really about the person and where they are right now and where they are in the world right now. So when we look at the crosswalk and when you take a look at the document, you'll see that first all of the different areas in the five different initiatives are put together and how they relate to the person and themselves, where they are right now in the world. And uh, these, these questions, uh, you know, you could apply to yourself, to ourselves, uh, and, and different, different, different points in our, our lives. And, uh, I dare say uh, most of us uh, have asked and continue to ask, uh, uh, who am I, and what does this all mean anyway? Uh, and uh, you know, have all the decisions I've made led to that which I was hoping to become? So this is no different, and and so these are these are not questions that you ask only one time. The second section uh, of the of the crosswalk 
again, taking the leadership from the, from the pond. It's called my world. And uh, uh, where do I live? How did I get here? Um, you know, part of uh, part of the the whole notion of of respect and self determination is um, that a person have a choice to be exactly where they are right now with whom that they they are living. And I think uh, those of us who've been around for more than a year uh, <laughs> realize that that, uh, that that's a that's an embarrassing question for us to uh, to, to really address. Um, where do I express myself? Uh, in my home, uh, in my in my work, and in social and in social places, and frequently, just like us, we're sometimes different at work than we are at home. Uh, maybe more more outgoing in one place more than the other. I feel more at home, and I feel more reticent to, at, at work. And social places scare me, or just the re, just the reverse. You could reverse reverse that order. How do I express myself? And where's my where's my comfort? Where I am, and where do I belong? Uh, do I belong here? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders grew up in uh, in Brooklyn. Is that where he belongs? You know, is he is he a Brooklynite? Uh, uh, there are many places that help define who we are, and uh, sometimes we we find ourselves yearning to to live in a different place because we think it'd be more expensive of who we'd like to be. Uh, we love our families. Sometimes it's nice to love them from a distance. Um, where can I where can I build new uh, new relationships and new possibilities? What will help stimulate uh, my growth as a person? And finally, the third area is the area of my dreams and the idea of how do I want my life to be in the future. And for many of the people that we support, this is a concept that's never been asked of them before. Um, whether we were afraid to ask because we didn't know if we could help them there or just no one's ever asked that question of them. But really to now start, if you look again at the crosswalk, all of these different initiatives are based on what the person wants and oftentimes decisions that we make today about what we think we want or where we want to be tomorrow. So we really do have to start asking people about their dreams and where they want to be and how can I express myself more fully. How can we support people to be able to do that so we can really understand them so then they can let us know where it is that they may want to be and how they can participate more in the life in their community. And we all know that we're talking about being more in the community, but what is that? That doesn't mean just the car ride through the McDonald's drive-thru. That really is how is somebody going to participate and be an active member in the community and truly have a social role. These are concepts that may not be new for a lot of us to be talking about it all these many years, but to bring it to fruition and be a real reality, we have to start asking people what it is that they want. And finally, how can somebody be of service to really be useful and productive in society? I think at the end of the day, and Regis has pointed this out, it's whether you're receiving services or not. Everybody, at some point in time, very often says, what, what is my purpose here? What am I doing here? And how can I be of service? So we broke this walk into these areas as well to help you see the relationship that all of these initiatives have to each other. Now we're going to tell a, a couple of stories, and um, uh, and we're, we're going to tell. I'm, I'm going to. I'll, I'll tell one, and then Kathy will. But uh, in looking at this, uh, looking at this crosswalk. Uh, you're probably, you know, straining to maybe read, you know, what's in the palms here. People are connected to national sports, and then, and you see the commonalities uh, going, going, going from left to right. But let, let me start with uh, a story about a, a woman we'll call Annette, and uh, I met Annette uh, a number of years ago. She's now, now uh, gone through her reward, uh, but uh, this was at a time when uh, deinstitutionalization was really very active. Uh, in, in, in New York State. It still is, for, for that matter, but it was really active uh, a number of years ago. And Annette lived in an institution, and the agency that I worked for at the time um, uh, went and interviewed a number of people at, at this particular state institution and um, uh, interviewed Annette and also people who knew her very well. And uh, 
um, asked Annette, you know, if she would like to perhaps live somewhere else and, you know, that, that sort of thing. And <clears throat> anyway, she ended up in a group home that we operated. She was already um, into her 70s, so she was not a young person. And uh, one of the things that the, the staff at the developmental center uh, said to us was, uh, you know, Annette's going to bring mm, her collection of dolls. She has a small collection of dolls. And uh, she'll favor one more than the other uh, at any given time. And she'll say, oh, this is uh, you know, my baby, my baby. And she didn't, she didn't have much expressive uh, verbal uh, uh, language available to her, but she was very expressive. And she was highly communicative. And uh, this was one area in which she would, uh, she would, she would say uh, to the doll in front of uh, uh, staff and others, uh, my baby. And, um, and the, the staff at the developmental center uh, counseled us that, you know, humor her and, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is one, of her, one of her few pleasures and she likes to, uh, she's learned how to crochet a little bit and, and knows a few of those uh, eye-hand coordination skills. But uh, just, just humor her with that and it, and it pleases her and so just, just, just be nice to her with that. No, that, that seemed easy enough. As time went on, um, uh, one of the one of the DSPs and a social worker who uh, kind of who took a liking to her uh, to Annette, um, uh, you know, asked her about the, her dolls and and if the dolls had names and all of that, and they didn't. That was just called my baby. And uh, in the course of of discovery, let's put it that way, um, they really began to believe that that perhaps there is something to what she is uh, what she is saying and I think you, you can kind of guess where this uh, this may be going um, uh, this before Facebook this is before <laughs> Facebook so, so research into people's lives were, were not as instantaneous as, as they are right now embarrassingly so uh, and uh, the the social worker and the DSP t together uh, found uh, this uh, members of her family uh, through uh, through records, and she lived with she lived with her her family, and they said, well, what is this? Uh, uh, she's always talking about her dolls and her baby, and and uh, this one uh, cousin who was uh, I guess at that point beginning to to uh, uh, be elderly uh, said, well, let me just tell you something. She lived with us. We lived in a big big house, and she lived with us, and um, she had a baby, and. Uh, we're not sure who the father ever was, and she had the baby. And when she had the baby, we then decided to put her in an institution, and that we, the large extent family, we raised that baby. And um, and she says, I feel badly about all of this now, but uh, but that's what happened. And so, in a sense, the cat was out of the bag. And we did a little bit more exploration, and we said, Do you know where this baby is? And she says, Yes, yes. And it turned out that uh, this the, this baby, Annette's, Annette's daughter, lived in the town adjacent to her group home, which is really quite a coincidence. And uh, so the DSP and, and, and the social worker made contact and they said, this is what we've learned from your family. She said, well, that's all impossible because, um, um, you know, my mother died in birth, that's what I was told. And um, my family, my larger family, uh, raised me, for which I was very grateful. <clears throat> and um, and my life goes on. And so she, they said, we think we found your mother. And uh, at that point, uh, she said, I, I don't think I can have this conversation with you. And they said, well, um, you know, we spoke with, with we spoke with a cousin, and and uh, we think we know uh, a little bit more about this. And and you know, feel free to speak to other other people in your family. And uh, here's where you can call us. Um, time passed, months, and uh, the uh, the daughter called uh, called this uh, the social worker and DSP, and, and um, she says, you know, I think I'd like to see, I guess, my mother from afar. And they arrange for that, and then that was the, the beginning of her own meltdown, and she says, I really need to see my mother. Uh, and then that was arranged. Anyway, the, the full story is that for the rest of her life, Annette's life, uh, 
she became integrated with her actual family, her daughter and her daughter's children, and she was a part of every birthday and every um, uh, Catholic ceremony that uh, that attends a uh, growing up in a, in a, in a Catholic uh, in a Catholic situation, and uh, and. She died. She died a grandmother. She and and she was with uh, she was with her baby. So, th this is a story of people paying attention and uh, uh, really understanding that there is discovery. This is obviously very dramatic, but if unless t two people uh, didn't believe in her, this would never never have happened, and Annette would have passed, and there would be no no connection. So if you were to look at uh, this chart again, uh, and I recommend that you start with stories. Start with stories that you think are, are, are good, wholesome, great discoveries about a per where a, an individual uh, person is really enabled to uh, realize more of their more of their life because you've paid attention. So, uh, the CQ well measures as people are connected to, to natural supports. Uh, the core competency is getting to know the person through assessment and discovery. The code of ethics. My first allegiance is to the person being supported, and everything else flows from that. The, Fed, the HCBS regulations supporting full access to the community and any other person not receiving so that any other person can enjoy. And so, <clears throat> she became part of her own natural family. Uh, and person-centered planning, that the person invites all uh, to the planning that, uh, that she, uh, she chooses. And she, she made choices that really became realizations. So that's a, that's a dramatic story. But, we, you know, everybody that's on this webinar has, you know, dozens of mm -hmm. great uh, stories about human potential that's been realized and it's been realized because someone has helped enable that to happen. They didn't make it happen, they enabled it to happen. So, Kathy? Yeah, thank you, Regis. That's an amazing story about Annette. Um, and it really does demonstrate how all of these different initiatives are related and how competent and ethical people working to provide supports to people, they're really doing all of these different initiatives. In, I don't even want to say in a different way, it's actually in the same way. The second section that we help divide this into is my world. And again, from left to right, you can see how under CQL, people interacting with other members of the community relates to a competent support person being able to help them actively participate in the community. The person has to be competent and, and capable of doing that and providing that support. And the Code of Ethics really help us understand that our dedication is to those relationships to help that person build those relationships and to advocate with people. We always say we want to help ad advocate with people. Advocating for people is admirable, but if we can help people learn to ad teach people to advocate for themselves, even better. And as you keep going across, you'll see that HCBS regs that respecting people's um, and being observant of their cultural and religious and spiritual preferences, again, we're not going to help people be in the world with what we think or where we think they ought to be, but it's where they want to be. And finally, a person-centered planning is planning that it reflects the person's meaningful activity in the general community. You can see how all are related, how the supports are really the same. These aren't five different things coming from five different planets. They're really basically supporting the person for their, where they are in the world. And now we're moving on to my dreams. I talked about that a little bit earlier before. And really having the conversation with people about their future. It's not an easy concept for people who very often live day to day. A lot of times people we support are very aware that the roof over their head and the food on the table is being given to them by somebody else. And they don't think about tomorrow. They're just hoping to get through today. So to have the conversations with people about their future is definitely a new concept. And I, I can share a story, um, an experience that I had. I was conducting a personal outcome interview with a gentleman. And it was one of my first interviews. And um, John, John is uh, a gentleman who um, is larger than life. 
really. <laughs> he takes great pride in the fact that he works out. He's quite the bodybuilder, a uh, very large guy, and has a bit of an intimidating persona, and that's definitely how he wants to be. So in the conversation with John, he was a very tough guy, and everything was very tough. And throughout the conversation as we were talking during the interview, um, John did reveal that he loves movies. So in talking about somebody's future, again, that's a hard concept, and I don't really even get the impression that anybody ever asked on that before. So the way I asked him was I said, if there was a movie made about you, I didn't want to know the bitter end, but getting towards the end of the movie, I asked John, how would he picture himself in that movie? And this very big, tough guy, he took a minute, sat back, got pretty thoughtful. And then you could see he had a picture in his head. And he said that he saw himself sitting in a big old rocking chair on a big porch on a big old farmhouse. He made sure I understood he did not want to work on a farm. He had no interest in farming, but he wanted a big old farmhouse. And there he was, an older man with all his grandchildren running around him. That came from this big, tough guy. And before I could say anything, and I have to tell you, I was a little speechless at that point, maybe a little teary-eyed, true. He sat back and he said, I guess i got to get myself my GED, because that's the only way I'm going to get myself a job. And that's the only way I'm going to get myself a girlfriend. She's got to work, by the way, because he's a real feminist, he said. But he wanted a girlfriend who would eventually become his wife. So he would one day be able to have all those grandchildren running around. I shared this with John's team, and believe me, John's team a bunch of good, dedicated people. They had no idea. Because nobody ever really asked John these questions before. And put it in a way that this big, tough guy, who this is how he gets through life, being big and tough, was not going to talk about those things. So it was really eye-opening to start having that conversation with John. And if you get and you look at the chart that we have here from left to right, it, it was helping him choose personal goals. It was asking questions because how are you going to choose the goals today if you don't know what you want to be doing tomorrow? So we have to ask him about tomorrow. As far as the competencies, people supporting people have to get to know that person and ask questions because how are we going to know what they want and provide what they want or need if we don't ask them? And the code of ethics is really you have to do it in a respectful manner, just like you would want somebody to be respectful of us as well. And really, really true integrity and responsibility because now the team has responsibility to John to help him achieve or at least work on those things that he wants to. We're not promising the farmhouse. We can't all have everything we want in life. A lot of you may know me, know that Kathy Brown wants a beach house. I can't have my beach house, but I can live as close as possible and go as often as I want. So these things don't mean that we're going to give everything, everybody everything they want, but we certainly can help them get close to their dreams. HCBS federal regs, the federal government is telling us to do these things and that this service plans have to reflect what people want and also minimizing their risk and that's through informed decision making. John's going to need a lot of support to make a lot of decisions as he goes through this life plan that he wants to put together and we have to help him understand and make those informed decisions. And then finally, really through person-centered planning and have that with meaning, we first had to understand what it was that John wanted. So you can see, as we just said before, I'm sure you all have stories, and I have a lot more, but we don't have a lot of hours. But it really is just showing you how all these different initiatives are related to each other and how they can help support people and not feel that your team members don't have to feel overwhelmed by all of this. So let's talk about why all this changed because, uh, you know, we're all doing the best that we can. We're doing great jobs. But what we're really doing is we're going from old funding rates to new funding rates. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. That is another webinar. But that money is going to follow the person and it's got to be what the person wants. We're going from congregate settings, group settings to individualized. No more workshops. We're talking about real employment. We're getting away from group homes for people to be able to be at home. And program plans is now its self-determination. 
Again, people aren't going to fit into cookie cutter things that we've put together. It's really about what they want and how they're going to know what they want if we don't help support asking them. It's not no longer about compliance. It really is going to be about the metrics and how it's going to be measured, these services. Status quo is not acceptable. Struggle for relevancy. And state contracts go into MCO contracts. This is really the reason that all this transformation is being put into place. The, uh, why, <laughs> we, we understand what's going on, what's going on in our field and how the thinking is, is, uh, is being adjusted and it's being adjusted uh, dramatically. And um, why, why uh, address for professional transformation? It's because 80% uh, of the people in our field are, are, are DSBs and, and as we know, they're a shrinking resource and still as, as great as uh, the DSPs that you're associated with are, um, are still not, still not fully, fully prepared. And managed care will evaluate the, the direct support service deliverables. I mean, that's where, that's where it all meets the road, as they say, uh, with uh, quality being defined at the, at the point of service between a DSP and a person with a, with a disability. All right. Well, we're also going to talk about, too, and what, you know, help is how, how, how is organizational culture improvement going to come about? And that's what these initiatives are for. These initiatives aren't supposed to wear us down and be a burden to us, but it's really supposed to help us figure out how we're going to do this. The POMs and the competencies, the ethics, HCBS, PCP, they're all cultural initiatives, which we just talked about before. It's how does it feel to be here? It's the whole culture. It is not also just one area in your organization. There has to be a cascading commitment to respect and competence. Really, it has to go from the top, and that is the people we support and our DSPs down to the executives and on the way, the way back up. The, uh, I, I would challenge uh, uh, people on the, on the webinar, not, not at the moment, but uh, to uh, write the unwritten rules for getting along. Every organization, every program within an organization, every service, single individualized service within an organization has unwritten rules. And when you write those unwritten rules for how do you, how do you get along, then you're beginning to, to question what culture uh, really is. And it it's, it's, can be a, a scary exercise, uh, but I would, I would challenge you to do that. Uh, and as Kathy was saying, cascading through the organization, uh, it's not just the DSPs, it's the, the frontline supervisors who have to provide uh, that, that example and all of the feedback, um, the middle managers to whom the frontline supervisors report, as well as the executive executive team. Everybody has to be on the same page, and everybody has to be thinking alike. So, so the person-centered thinking that we spoke of earlier really has to be throughout the organization. So that's what we mean by by cascading. And we'll do this very quickly. This uh, this Venn diagram is is something that uh, that my good friend Joe Macbeth uh, uh, created, and I think it's if you if you wonder what workforce transformation look like looks like or should look like this is what it is you have to know what you have to know what to do that's the knowledge part uh, skills are you have to be able to do what it is that uh, that you know and the values are what what are the principles that undergird both the knowledge and the skills and at that very very heart that center where all all three uh, intersect that's where quality supports uh, really happen but it has to have all of those things, it, we have to have knowledge, we have to have skills, and the values. So it's the ethics, the competencies, uh, as, as well as uh, all of the training, training based, based on research. So with that workforce transformation, what does transform DSPs look like? So we've gone in the past from custodians and task workers to caregivers where human potential feels personal and you bring your heart and your values to work. You love my guys. There is nothing wrong with that. We are not saying that people are bad people at all for being caregivers. 
But all of these new initiatives and all of these new regulations are requiring more than that. It has to be more than a caregiver. We have to give people choices and help them make informed decisions. And that's where our workforce being transformed through the initiatives becomes support professionals. Caring, but professional people with ethics and, confident, and being confident while they're doing it. The quality and system transformation, individualized supports, that really requires more than just showing up for work and following instructions and being a nice person. It really requires that a person is able to provide individualized support. They're going to have to make independent judgments, be very ethical in their commitments, and be very skilled. That's what all of these initiatives are going to help your workforce be able to do, because we're not going to be able to provide quality services without the quality workforce. And in the end, what's the proof of the pudding, so to speak? Uh, what does a service, what will service transformation look like? It's a life value by the person. Uh, the person determining their choices through informed decision making. Again, it's not just any old choice. It's really informed decision making. There's a whole technology. And Kathy was talking about NADSB taking a national leadership uh, position on this, and the work and the Regional Centers for Workforce Transformation has resources on the website, which we'll show you in a second. Um, it means that the person establish, establishes real friendships, unpaid uh, friendships, and community participation, uh, learning skills for valued social social roles, and it, and then feeling good about it, enjoying uh, self-esteem due to the great relationships that are being built as well as realizing new abilities that they that people never thought that they they had and that's what it looks like it's it's boiled down to some very very simple observations and uh, we're going to skip this so really what we hope we've been able to do for all of you listening today is talk about these five different initiatives and lay it out in a crosswalk that helps you see all the relationships between the initiatives and how they are not another thing, oh my gosh, we have to do, but really a way to support you and your team provide the best quality services we can provide. We've referred to the website very often, haven't we, Regis? And here it is, www.workforcetransformation.org. This has been put together by the regions, Regional Centers of Workforce Transformation. All of the information that we're talking about can be found there. There's uh, resources there. This webinar will be there. The crosswalk is there. So it is an amazing resource for all of you to tap into all in one place. And in addition to that, if you still have any questions, you can contact Kirsten who is at NYSACRA. Her contact email is there. You can contact me, Kathleen Brown. My contact information is there, as well as Regis's. Now, we know that um, there may have been some questions. We're not sure if we can get to answer everybody's questions, but we may be able to help answer some of them. We hope this crosswalk is of value to all of you, and please get in touch with us. If you have any further questions, we are definitely here to help you out. Go. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Regis. Well, wow, that was a lot of information, um, and you did it in 50 minutes. Thank you so much. Actually, there are, there are not any questions um, appearing in the chat, but I have one, maybe two. Um, you know, given the amount of information that you gave, I, I would assume there's a lot of people in the audience saying, wow, where do we begin? This is a lot of, you know, the, the, the code of ethics, the POMs, the competencies, the the settings rule. If I'm a program manager, if I'm a frontline supervisor, how do I get my team prepared to, to begin this journey? I, I would say, uh, Joe, a uh, great question, uh, that I begin with, a, begin with the stories. And, I, and I, I recommend that most meetings start off with a positive story anyway. And uh, to have a team or someone on the team uh, tell, uh, tell a story that they feel good about. And they don't have to be all self-examining. And then, and then look at uh, look at uh, this crosswalk and see how it fits, uh, and see how the, this uh, this crosswalk fits into into the uh, into the into the story that uh, that uh, was, was was just told. And I think you really need to. What we try to do is to make the principles of, of 
all this uh, very simple pointing out pointing out commonalities. But I think that's the way that's the way to look at it because if you try to pull it apart, uh, let's say the the, the, the HCBS uh, uh, rule, uh, it's it becomes so, in a sense, overwhelming. Oh my God! What do, where do we start with food? Where do we start with <laughs> with with locks? You know, and uh, it, whereas it really become, it really makes more sense when you you, you speak about a person and and uh, success that has occurred with a person, and just see how it pertains, and maybe see see what you left out. Um, and, and and so it, it really could challenge it could challenge a whole team to uh, uh, to uh, uh, assist a person in realizing their potential as they as they see it uh, by, uh, by by trying some new things. So um, that's what, how I think it might be helpful. Yeah, I I could not agree more. As you know, I think that when you when Every direct support professional has a story or two to tell of how uh, they've helped somebody accomplish something. And when you break that story down, you can get to the competencies and the ethics and the palms and, and start there. And, and the light bulb kind of goes off. And mm -hmm. Kathy had mentioned the intentionality behind the work of direct support. That's what this is all about. Um, so thank you for that answer. Before we finish, I just want to uh, let everybody know that, to check your inbox, check your mailbox, because we have sent you a, uh, a, uh, an email that has registrations for the following seven webinars, or the following, excuse me, the following six webinars. Um, you can register for them today, but also you'll find a link to the survey. And we ask you to fi fill out that link. It's a fillable PDF form and send it back to us. We need to get back to our funders um, on how or, uh, or what you thought about these, these webinars. So uh, Regis and Kathy, I thank you very much. I learned a lot. And I hope thank that you, I hope the audience uses yeah. the, um, the crosswalk because what a great tool that is. Um, and unless you have any final words, I think we'll sign off. Anything else? No, thank you for the opportunity, Joe. Very much. Thanks. Yes, thanks, Joe. It's our pleasure. Thank you both. Have a good day.